Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Conquer the Gauntlet Pro and Strength and Speed owner, Evan Preparis. We're back for another episode. Got a guest with me on the line. Before we get to her, though, a quick word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Compex. Compex is the maker of those electrical muscle stimulators. You may have seen me or some of the CTG Pro team using them. Uh, essentially, it forcibly contracts your muscles. On a low setting, it's great for recovery. On a higher setting, it's good for actually building explosiveness or muscular endurance. There's a diff- bunch of different settings on the actual stimulator device there. And they make ones with wires, and they also make a wireless one. If you have some extra money to spend, I would go with the wireless one. Super nice and obviously a lot, it's a lot easier when there's not wires hanging off. And then their other big product is they have a comp, they have the Compex Fix. So it's one of those electric, it's one of those massage guns. And I just picked one up earlier this year. Love it. Um, my my kids love it. Everyone loves it in the house. So people, whenever I start using it for my legs or something, people will start lining up for back massages on it. So check those out. It's definitely on the lower cost side of the spectrum compared to some of the other ones that are currently available. But yeah, great product. All right. Joining me, I have Stephanie Bishop. Steph, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a while. Yeah. For those of you who don't know Steph Bishop, she won World's Toughest Mudder in 2016, and she's an elite slash pro adventure racer. So uh, yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of her training background, and what's cool about her is she, she operates on the very, very long end of the endurance spectrum. So we're talking multi-day events, uh, expedition-length adventure racing that takes, you know, 24 hours to a week long to finish some of these events. So pretty wild training background and training history there. Um, so yeah, Steph, welcome to the show. And um, let's start off with just tell us, oh, so the other things we're going to talk about this episode, besides uh, how the how COVID is affecting adventure racing, but also some of her personal stuff, you know, how she got into OCR. And she recently had, or at the end of March had COVID, and is recovered and is doing well, but we're going to talk a little bit more how that affects has been affecting her at the elite end of the endurance spectrum. So let's start off, Steph, with uh, just tell us a little bit about you because we kind of gave you a brief intro. You know, where are you from and um, how you got into adventure racing? Sure. Um, I am born and raised uh, Long Island. Yeah. New York gal. That's right. <laughs> no. um, who I think where the tallest hill is maybe 250 feet high, a vert gain. So uh, my training mantra is no mountain, no problem. So you have to get a little creative. Um, I've always just been athletic and, and I saw Eco Challenge on TV when I was maybe like 10 or 12 years old. And I looked at that and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that, mom. And my mom was terrified. Um, <laughs> but it looked, it was so appealing to me to just, to just like run around in nature and to go on a true adventure. So that was like always my end goal as an athlete was to get into adventure racing. It took me a little longer than I originally anticipated, but along the way I, you know, had some really great experience doing other sports, like outside of past college and all that stuff. But I got into death racing Spartan death race in 2010. And I did four of those and I completed four of those. Um, and that was my first taste at an event over 24 hours. I think the longest one that we did that I did was 65 hours. Um, so that definitely prepared me for adventure racing in a sense. And then from there, I started doing some OCRs. At that point, I was more into the longer, the ultra endurance events. Um, I always found that I thrived when I was sleep deprived. Like when people would start to fall off, I would like get a burst of energy and be like, now's my time to go after it. So that's like why I think people haven't seen me as much in the, like the, the main OCR scene is because like the shorter races are not my wheelhouse. Um, I was unfortunately like planning on doing some ultra beasts this year, but obviously um, their Spartan has canceled their whole race schedule. But, you know, that also led me to doing World's Toughest Mudder, um, which took again a few years to do, but I love that race. It's such a fun event. And I love the format of that. I think it's so much, it's such a mental race to race the same loop over and over and over for 24 hours, which is completely different from adventure racing where you are following you're with a team. Well, I guess maybe we should talk about what is adventure racing. People that, hear what it is 
and they don't know what it is. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because <laughs> the thing that always happens at work where I, um, where I work and they're always like, this is Evan. He's an adventure racer. I'm like, I'm not an adventure racer. <laughs> it's a different sport, guys. It's a completely different sport. And I think sometimes even within the industry, we are not helpful in creating a delineation there because I know the, you know, one of the other international OCR federations that was trying to start like a championship they took Primal Quest, one of the expedition-length adventure races, and they were like, this is the, the ultra, you know, expedition-length OCR championship. And it's like, well, that's, it's a different thing. So explain, yep. <laughs> explain what adventure racing is and the different lengths and kind of what you do, et cetera. So adventure racing has been around for decades. It's been this kind of niche sport, um, you know, just because of what it is. So it's a team sport. Um, and the the premise is that your team needs to find these control points, these points on a map that either you have to plot yourself using coordinates or they're sometimes pre-plotted by the race director. And you don't have GPS. You have to use a map and a compass. That's your way of getting around, of finding those points. And there are usually four disciplines in, in most adventure races, sometimes three, but it's you're on foot. So it's either trekking or trail running or off trail running because sometimes you're not following a trail. A lot of the times you're off trail. Um, mountain biking. Um, the subset of mountain biking is my favorite discipline called hike a bike. It's not an official discipline, but um, it's pretty much like you're going through terrain where you can't bike through it. So you have to hike your bike. Um, usually there's a paddling, they, there are paddling sections. Um, I've paddled in canoes and in pack rafts, sometimes they're kayaks. Um, so all different types of watercrafts. And then some, usually there's some kind of like rappelling section or rope section, um, you know, something in that sense. Um, and that's it. So the, the fastest team to make it to the finish line with clearing the course, meaning getting every single point on the map wins. So if one team finishes, five hours before the second team that finishes, but the second team gets all the points and the first team doesn't, the second team actually wins the race. Um, and teams are usually consist anywhere from three to four people. And to be on like the, the competitive level, it's usually, it's co-ed. So generally that means um, like a four person team, it's like three men and one woman. Um, they're definitely, it's, you know, the, women are more of a commodity in the sport. Um, so when, you know, teams find a good female racer, they tend to, you know, stick with them for a long time. Gotcha. Now, uh, this will be especially relevant, and I didn't even, uh, this was completely chance. I should have actually put this together, but uh, I believe Eco Challenge was restarted, right? And they're going to air it um, starting mid-August. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I don't know the exact date. It's like the end of the first week or the second week of August. And there are a lot of You'll see a lot of OCR competitors in there. Um, I know Ryan, Ryan Atkins and Ray Koval were on the same team. Um, so I, and I'm sure there were other OCR athletes in there. I mean, that's like the pinnacle of, of adventure racing. And because that had a huge budget behind it, you're going to see stuff in that race that you wouldn't see in a, in a normal adventure race, mainly because of cost. <laughs> Gotcha. Now, you know, we, we talked, obviously we're, we're touching on the long and the expedition length. So what's the shortest basically length of adventure racing all the way out to the longest? What's the spectrum? They, you know, like 12 ish hours. Usually in my world, I feel like, you know, 24 hours is like the bare minimum. Um, but they have like row gains, which is more like orienteering races. Generally you're just on foot. But there are smaller races. I think there's a 12 hour in New England. Um, but I've done races up to five days in length. That was the Adventure Racing World Championship. Um, and I tend to expedition length. To me, it starts around like the three day mark, um, you know, 24, 48 hours. Those are like the longest time. So when you hear like, oh, somebody's doing a 72 hour race. The winning teams do not come in at 72 hours. They come in sometimes a day before that. So, you know, so that's usually like the max time um, that the last teams start coming in. Interesting. So I've done two adventure races. It was actually, a, I did a 12 hour one and a 24 hour one. And it was me and two guys. Uh, this is way back in like 2004 or five. 
And my, my, my two friends are like, let's do the 24 hour one. And I was like, you know what? We've never done this before. Let's do the 12. And, um, they were real peer, peer, peer pressuring me to do the 24. And I was like, I think we should do the 12 because we don't know what we're doing. And they eventually- Could anybody, could anybody or like, was anybody an orienteer? Yeah, so we're, we're three military guys. So we're familiar with orienteering. Okay, um, good. <laughs> and and f- familiar with being in way over our head and doing things without the proper amount of training. So we felt okay going in. <laughs> um, 12, so we're like, all right. So we, we set on the 12 hour one. So- you know, it's funny you mentioned that about the finishing times because, you know, we're, we do a bunch of land nav, we do we rappel down a cliff, we do a bunch of mountain biking. Side note, none of us had ever been on a mountain bike before. That was entertaining. <laughs> um, we do uh, late kayaking. My lower back was killing me. Um, I did no, we did no paddling training. We just, just winged it again. And we come across the lake at like right at the 12-hour mark. And we run up with our score sheet and our orienteering card, and we're like, here it is. And the, uh, the guy behind the desk is like, here's your next set of points. And I was like, what? no, no, we're in the, tw- we're in the 12 hour. He's like, right. There's one more leg. And I was like, mother. So, yep. um, <laughs> we were, Ill- right. we were ill prepared for night ops and made it a couple more hours. And then out of our three headlamps, we lost one. The two of them were since you were running out of batteries and, uh, then one of them eventually died. And then we we're down to one headlamp and then we eventually just called it a called it a day so that was but that's that's adventure racing though like how many times have a a bike has broken down and we're to the point where it can roll and that's it so like i had a race uh nationals one year with my team my bike broke completely it rolled so we took a tow like we leashed the bike to another bike in front of it and we were on single track in like the georgia woods and my other teammate was towing the bike with my other teammate on it. Cause I'm like, I'm not riding that bike with like, it doesn't function. So my other teammate who was a better mountain biker at the time, he's like, I'll ride it. And we towed the bike for 20 miles. Jeez. That's what happens. You know, like you have it pretty much in some of these, some of these places you're really remote. So it's actually faster for your team to just keep going than it is to say, you know, what, I think we're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even when we when we decided like, all right, we're done. We we were still, you know, a couple miles from the start point. We had to we had to like get back to a road and sh- like schlep back along along the road to get back to the start point. So mm-hmm. it, it wasn't like it was over and someone picked us up. Like we, you know, we still had another hour of like walking left to, to do. Yeah, yeah, you're out there. I mean, so like for some for some of the races, like the World Championship, I did it in Wyoming. We started in Jackson Hole, and we finished in Casper. So we went like, I think it's like 450 miles or something. And one of our bike legs, I think it's like 14 legs for the whole race, but leg nine was like a 170 mile mountain bike ride. (laughs) Given it was on like a lot of fire roads and stuff, but it was in the desert and it just dragged on and on and on. And you realize on some of these roads, you are in the middle of nowhere. And it's just, just like, you just have to keep going. That's it. It's such a mental, I like it. It's so mental. And then the sun goes down again and you're, you know, you're like, here we go again. Another night out. I haven't slept in a few days. Uh, but like in my eyes, I'm like, how cool is this guy? It's like, we're like going on this mission right now. We have to go get to this next checkpoint. <laughs> I think like you have to have some kind of mindset like that. Yeah. You know, it keeps it interesting. It keeps you engaged and it doesn't really break you down. So you talked about obviously the mental aspect, which for these multi-day things has got to be huge, right? I mean, that's got to be a huge percentage of your capability. Uh, on the physical side, you obviously need to be in good shape. But so like, what does your training look like when you're prepping for one of these expedition level length uh, adventure races? Like give me like a week in your life. Oh, a week in my life. It's a lot of time on feet. It's not necessarily speed work. Um, I'm more doing just longer endurance running. Um, some, a lot of like recovery effort runs, um, uh, some recovery, some hikes with a pack, because remember like during these races, you only get, they have transition areas where you change disciplines and, you know, you sometimes, you, you know, you have bins there and you can like restock on whatever food you need. And sometimes you're taking food for what may be the next 40 hours. So you have to like, you're carrying a bunch of stuff. And plus gear and everything on top of that. 
So there's definitely some like hiking with the pack on. Um, I'm mountain biking a few days a week. I'm probably running five days a week, five times a week, maybe six. Hiking maybe another like two times a week. But that's like slow. It's just time on feet with the pack. Um, biking a few days a week. And then if it's good weather, I'm paddling. But if it's not good weather and I can't get in the water, I'm doing like very paddle specific strength training. And I'm doing other strength training on top of that. Nothing really intense. It's all more my maintenance stuff to keep me injury free, you know, and to keep me moving well. Um, going into a really long race, like I could be putting in easily like 20 hours a week between everything. But again, it's not like very high intensity. Um, if it's a shorter race, that time drops and some of those workouts definitely get a lot more intense. Um, because I consider like a 24 hour race to be like a sprint. Um, you're, you're, it's insane. Like, I mean, the race I did last year up in Canada, the wilderness traverse was, we finished in 18 hours. It's a 30 hour race. My team won it. I felt like I was at my lactic, like it was a lactic threshold workout for 18 hours straight. That's what it felt like. So <laughs> it's so wild. Funny. <laughs> yeah. It's just nonstop because you can't make an, if you make an error in that short of a race that could make or break if you're going to win that race or not. So I remember, so 2016, you won World's Toughest Mudder. And then 2017 was when they started doing the CBS televised uh, eight-hour races, Toughest yep. Mudder. And I remember talking to you at one of those races, and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm just really not good at this short stuff. And I was like, I was just like laughing because it just showed how, how skewed your perspective was. <laughs> because every other person on that start line is like, this is the longest thing I've ever done. You know, like, this is so long, you know. And you're like, yeah, it's it's really short. You know, it's just it's just not long enough for me. And uh, I just thought you know, it was funny. I'm like a, it's like a an, a car engine in the winter. I like you know you need to like turn I need to like turn on the engine, let it like sit in the driveway for a little bit before it warms up, and and then I'm good to go, and I can go for a really long time. But I think also like it plays into like for like you know like asthma and things like that like I just feel more comfortable when my body's really warm and then I can start pushing um I, that's why you'll never see me run like a 5k is a nightmare I joke that I have to run a 5k before I, I would even consider to race the 5k because my <laughs> body needs that much time to warm up I hear you so you mentioned you still live on Long Island or in New York? I'm currently, yeah, I'm currently in New York right now. Um, you know, obviously my calendar has been pretty much scrapped Wipe for the clean. whole year. Yeah. Wipe clean, but at the same time, um, there are so many mountains just like north of New York. And if, you go, if I go five hours north, I've been waiting to get up to the Adirondacks, you know, just just been like hanging out more down here. But even like an hour north of New York City, there's Harriman State Park. And it's not like, you know, massive mountains, but you can get in some solid runs up there on some really technical terrain, actually. That was actually was going to be my next question was how do you train for elevation if you have limited access? But I guess driving north is the answer. It is. But even like on Long Island, there are some there's some like roads and hills I'll run. And I just literally just crank out repeats like I go up, down and I'll do it for like two hours or there's a trail I run a lot on. And in about, I'd say 15 miles, I can get, if I'm doing like the more gentle section, I can still get about 4,000 feet of, of gain. Um, if I really stick to this one mile section and just run it back and forth, um, I can get a lot more than that in a, in a much shorter time. So, I mean, the difference is though, is that when you're running short and steep, and I'm talking these climbs maybe are like 50 feet or, you know, 60 feet and from, you know, bottom to top that um you're not getting it's a different type like I have to not I have to think about pacing because it's up and down so it's relentless it's it's sneaky actually it's not like a long climb where you kind of dial in and you're just like okay I'm going to be climbing for the next 20 minutes or the next 45 minutes or the next hour it's more like I'm climbing for the next minute but I'm gonna like not slack on this downhill and then I'm going to push through the next climb to kind of still simulate the longer climbs. Gotcha. Okay. Good and answer. then there's my favorite uphill lunges. Those are the best. If I'm like, I have a 6% grade hill right across the street from me, six to 8% grade. 
doing uphill lunges on it for like 45 minutes. It is just, it just destroys my legs. It's great. Nice. Now I'm going to ask you the series of questions that people always ask me when I'm like, I do 24 hour obstacle course racing and they're like, well, you know, when do you sleep? And it's like, well, I don't cause I'm, I'm trying to win. But yep. you know, if you're doing, <laughs> if you're doing multi-day stuff, you know, at what point as someone who's trying to win, at what point do you start, you know, taking naps and kind of planning a sleep rest cycle versus just being like, all right, we're just going to push through nonstop to the end. So a 30 hour race, you don't sleep. Like you're going nonstop. Um, I would even say like a 72 hour race. Um, I, my theory is, is like, you can push your body 36 hours, um, before you really start to see a steep decline in your performance. But then like, I'm also a firm believer in like a 30 minute power nap can go a long way. It's tough. Like your team has to be in sync. So, you know, I've, raced a race before years ago and my team wasn't in sync with the napping and it was really rough because some of us would be like tired and some of us wouldn't be tired and it really hurt our performance because we couldn't get the sleeping down um i also think that if you lay down for too long er you know everything starts to swell up so you have to be really careful about that. You know, I say 30 minutes to maybe like an hour, hour and a half max. But if you want to win like an hour and a half nap, you're not taking an hour and a half nap. Definitely not. At least not in my world, you're not. Yeah. I mean, we, I did that death race with, I think, like 10 minutes of, an, of sleep. And that's just because we were waiting for the other half of the racers to come back because they went down to New York City. Um, we got, you know, we, we split half of us stayed in Vermont and the other half went on a surprise trip to New York city. But, um, you know, I was at that point, 60 hours without sleep. Um, so you can keep going. Um, you just have to just, it's help each other out and support each other, you know, mm -hmm. on a side note, I feel like four death race finishes has got to be some sort of record. Is that, I think. I don't think it is. No, I think some people have done more than I have, but I am four for four. And so I think, you know, that I definitely have a, I have a 100% completion rate. Uh, so I think maybe, you know, that might be like a, a smaller club, but I mean, anybody who shows up to that race and just pushes themselves to the line and beyond it, kudos to them because <laughs> that, that race is just wicked. Yeah, and if anyone wants to hear more about that, we interviewed Christina Armstrong, who finished a death race a couple of years ago on the podcast. That's an older episode. And then also uh, Tony Matisse just came out with a book called The Legend of Death, death Race. Yeah. Kind of goes through, you know, three years in a row, basically you know, very detailed account of, you know, what they're doing and what he was experiencing. So if anyone wants to check those out, uh, I think Tony's book is on hard copy, digital, and audio. So yep. did you read it yet? I have not read it yet, okay. but I, I need to read. I'm sorry, Tony, if you're listening <laughs> to this, I need to read your book. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I will relate to a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So continuing down the ultra OCR compared to death, I'm not death race compared to adventure racing. adventure racing. Sorry. The next question is right in ultra OCR. When I have to pee, I just, I just go, right. It just goes down my leg. Cause I'm getting in and out of water. Um, what's the bathroom plan for adventure racing do you just go or do you stop and actually like use the facilities um, well, use the wood line well <laughs> sometimes, yeah sometimes there's no uh, wood line i think it it depends because sometimes you're stopping like for a hot second to check the map and to make sure especially if you're like bushwhacking in the middle of the night um you're you know every once in a while like you stop just to make sure you're going in the right direction so people just kind of you just kind of almost like go in front of each other. Like there's really nobody cares. It's very relaxed. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. It's not like triathlon. I feel like where I used to do triathlon where like, you know, you're going on your bike. Yeah. I you just know, go on my so bike and it just trickles down your leg. And I mean, people aren't supposed to be drafting in that sport anyway. So there's, yeah, you, know, you don't have to true. worry about hitting anyone. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I got I got that. We used to do a college competition called Ranger Challenge, which is different than Best Ranger. It's like a ten man team, but one of the you always had you had to have one female, and she was 
she was she was one of the one of the boys essentially. So it was nine dudes oh, yeah. and one girl. And I mean, I similar similar situations with, uh, like that where you know sometimes people got to go and everyone's like, all right, I'm just taking knee facing the other direction and whatever. That's it. I mean, it's all it's like a natural thing that our bodies you know that our bodies do. I think like in the, especially in those scenarios, like I always tell people like if you see me, like if you race with me, it's like my manners go right out the window. But, but when I'm in like a normal, let's say like a more normal social situation, they, you know, I bring my manners back into, you know, into my world. Yeah. All right. Now let's continue with the comparison. So what about food? So for ultra OCR, I just go liquid diet for 24 hours essentially, and it doesn't bother me. Uh, but for multi-day, I think it, might start being a little different. So what's the fueling strategy you use? So for multi-day, it's kind of, I cover a bunch of different like flavor profiles, shall I say. So it's like sweet, savory. I like something tangy and like sour. Um, sometimes something like mildly spicy because sometimes you just get bored with what you're eating. So, you know, you don't just want liquid calories, obviously. You're going to want solid food. Um, for the expedition races, sometimes I leave a dehydrated meal in my pack because sometimes at the transition areas, they have hot water. They'll let you know beforehand. So you just dump your water in your, in your like dehydrated meal, throw the meal in your backpack. And then, you know, you're off and riding or running or trekking, and then you just eat it along the way. Um, unless you're going to take a few extra minutes in transition. Um, those are great, but I've had teammates take ramen noodles and, um, just put regular water in it, not even like warm water. And over like an hour or two, like it just softens up and it's edible. Um, and I always put in something into like my bins, something that's going to cheer me up, like something I'm looking forward to. Um, you know, for me, it's like, I well, it's, it's Red Bull for me, but uh, there are other things too. Like maybe it's like something, it's like dried mango or something. I, you know, it has to be something that's different than I normally have. Um, and that can just bring you out of a slump. Like it's amazing how like some random piece of food can make you feel so much better once you have it. So I do the same thing for ultra OCR, uh, and I use mostly use liquid, but that specifically that crave that reward type food. And I use a uh, double stuff Oreos mm -hmm. as my, as my oh, what, what's I always, love, love <laughs> and I usually have Red Bull, I have Red Bull and double stuff Oreos are my two things that I keep in my my race bag that um you'll see me if you'll see me if you, if you see me at like hour between hours like 18 and 24 that's usually what i'm uh layering on top of my normal nutrition i i have dumped a red bull into a hot chocolate before and drank it that's pretty yeah. good <laughs> it's just like this this will work you know and also you get these weird cravings and you also i think in general that you always need to have some food or liquid nutrition that you know that you can put in your body. And this is for any type of ultra racing, even just ultra OCR that you can have, even if you're dry heaving on like the, you know, wherever you're, wherever you are. Like the, for me, I, that's Red Bull. Like I drink, for, I, my teammate two years ago was pushing, like pushing my backpack, like pushing me forward while we were kind of like jogging. And I was dry heaving on the side. My stomach was a mess. And at the same time, when I'd stop dry heaving, I would take a slug of the Red Bull because I needed the calories. I needed the sugar. I really needed the caffeine. And they're like, in 10 minutes, I just did a 180. Like, I was fine. So there's always something you have to have. And maybe it's Oreos. I don't know. Maybe it's like, I don't know what else it could be. Like, maybe it's like rice with soy sauce. Like, you know, maybe it's a, a sweet potato or maybe it's just some like weird junk food that you just really enjoy, but always have something that you can eat in the, like the worst case scenario. I think that's absolutely great advice. And I recommend the same thing in my book, Ultra OCR Bible, Mud Run Guides book. So completely agree. Now there's two yeah. things I, I did, like I said, I did two adventure races, really enjoyed them. They're really cool experiences, really different. And, but there's two things that kind of prevented me from going, you know, diving headfirst into the sport. Uh, which is typically what I do when I find something I like. So I'm going to ask you kind of how you've been dealing with those two challenges. So the first okay. one is finding and maintaining a team, right? So I had two friends that would do it, but you know, some of them are wishy-washy, you know, they, and it's hard to find people who are as obsessive as myself about something um, when I find something that really interests me. So how have you been dealing with 
one finding and or maintaining a team? So uh, when I first got into the sport, um, I just met a, a random group of people actually through social media. And so they were, they wanted to go out there and do the best they could. You know, it wasn't about winning for them. A great, really great group of guys. Um, and so I was like, you know what, like, this sounds like a really good entry point for me because I'm going to get a lot of experience and I'm really going to like understand what adventure racing is about. And then if I really like it, I know I can push myself to find a more competitive team. Um, and then two years ago, or three, I guess it's three years ago, um, I was introduced to a team uh, to race that, that race in Canada, the Wilderness Traverse. Um, through, uh, I believe it was Peter uh, Dobos. He's a, like, he's a big in the OCR world. Um, uh, he posts a lot of stuff, like interesting, like scientific articles um, about yeah, like, you know. We bounce ideas off each other sometimes. Yeah, he's got some good ideas. Okay, there we go. Yep, so he, I believe it was him, thank you, Peter, that introduced me to some of the, these, these adventure racers. They've been in the scene for a very long time and I raced with them for that 30 hour race. And that was like my first real taste of racing hard and racing fast. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I love this. Like this is torture, but it's so much fun at the same time. Um, and then the following year I raced with people in the same circle, but a different team. Actually one of the athletes from the team from the previous year and two, two new guys, but everybody knows everybody. So in adventure racing, once you start to get to know people, um, they'll be like, oh, we need a fourth person for our team. I think there's only like a handful of teams that are, that race together all the time. Um, it seems like in some of the races, it, like at least from what I understand, you know, they're missing somebody, somebody can't race for whatever reason. So, you know, they go out into the circle of people that they know and they find, you know, a, a substitute for that race. Um, so, I mean, this year it's been tough because there are no races. So, I mean, I would love to, like next year, I would love to do a bunch of adventure races. I really miss it. Um, it's been a year since my last adventure race. So I'm putting it out there. If anybody knows a very highly competitive team, just get in contact with me. Yeah, I feel like once you're in the inner circle, I would imagine there's, again, there's just not that many people in that inner circle with that mix of skill sets and fitness level and in mental capacity so once i feel like you're in once you've broken into that circle i feel like it would just be it'd be too easy to be like oh well this person can't race and we'll switch that person out and yeah uh, and it's happened it's true like if people have asked me to do some of some of the bigger races and unfortunately it was like timing for some that i couldn't do things like that but um you know that's the name of the game i mean these some of these races like god zone in new zealand which is one of the most epic adventure races um I would have to be over there for like two weeks, you know, and if it doesn't fit into the schedule, it doesn't fit into the schedule. So, so, uh, you know, if people are looking to do adventure racing, start with like the shorter races, you know, get a taste of it, um, you know, before you dive into the longer stuff. Uh, but don't shy away from the longer stuff either, because it is, it tests your body in ways you never thought it would test it. And that's going to, I'm going to ask this question and then we'll jump back to my earlier question. So you mentioned testing your bodies in ways that pretty much are impossible to do anywhere else. Now, what does a recovery look like for a, you know, an expedition like the venture race? Like how much time are you taking off after something that long? So usually when I finish a race, uh, you have to go straight into like Sometimes like cleaning up, like unpack it, repacking your bike and all your stuff. So usually the recovery doesn't start right away. But um, for the most part, it's like shower, sleep, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, eat. <laughs> it's kind of like my recovery for a death race. I just eat whenever I'm hungry all the time for a few days. But I start moving. I make sure like unless something's wrong with my body, that I'm moving around daily. Like I'm not running per se, I'm walking. Maybe a few days later I hop on the bike if I'm not like sick and tired of riding my bike. Um, you know, I do more like lower impact stuff. Um, and then usually like a week later, I like kind of test my body a little bit more, but I'm not doing any like real hard training for probably like a few weeks, I would say. Um, I'll get out there and I'll do stuff, but the intensity, it depends, you know, you don't want to, you've just like 
you know, probably race for three plus days on little to no sleep. Like your body really needs some time to recover. Got it. All right. And so we'll jump back to my earlier question. So I mentioned there's two big things that kind of got prevented me from going headfirst into adventure racing. The second one is cost, right? So the, yeah. you know, you, you do these multi, essentially it's a multi-sport orienteering. So you need a mountain bike. A lot of times you need a kayak or a canoe or something like that. So what, I, I guess let's go with, you know, how have you been dealing with that in, enormous cost uh, for equipment? And then also like, I remember looking up once the entry for Primal Quest and it was so absurdly high. Like I was like, all right, I guess, I guess we're not, I, you know, I guess this is not going to be a long-term goal. Cause I think it was like $10,000 to entry or something, something insane. Oh, well that's, that's like a very, that's a, that's the high end. So um, if you're looking at like this, let's say like the smaller races, like smaller, like not the bigger uh, names, they're definitely like under, I would say a thousand dollars. I remember the uh, Adventure Racing World Championship, the entry fee was $1,500. But in my head, I was like, oh, that's a huge entry fee. But I'm like, wait a minute, let me break it down per day. I'm like, so I'm technically going on a self-propelled vacation in an area in places I'll never, ever see, like uh, probably in my lifetime, and very maybe places that not many people have seen in their life in general, the human population. So I'm like, okay, it's not bad. Like if I'm racing for five days, it's $300 a day. That's not so bad. You usually, most races provide um, watercraft, like they provide a, a kayak or canoes. Um, for the races when there are pack crafts, um, you, usually there's like a rental company that your team can rent a pack craft, so it's not that expensive. Um, I do suggest, like you usually need your own paddle, so that's an investment, but um, you know, you can get a good paddle for, couple hundred bucks like a good paddle a really good paddle that you like um and that paddles well because that makes a difference as i found out very quickly um and the bike if you like biking it's an investment piece and you'll have it for a long time you don't need like yeah it's so nice to have super fancy full suspension carbon fiber but like i have an aluminum frame trek hardtail I've had it for the past four years. I have definitely outgrown the bike by now. My skill level is, is like, I'm, I'm at risk of like breaking my bike for where I take it nowadays. But, um, you know, it's done me well. A lot of adventure racing is on a lot of fire roads, not so much like technical, like downhill mountain biking trails. So, you know, you can get by with a hardtail and that's a lot cheaper than a full suspension. Gotcha. But, yeah. And like, yeah, like, you know, like you said, like Primal Quest is a pricier race, but like you probably won't do Primal Quest right away. And you could always right. like, That's I true. think like, you know, people can always go to like, maybe there's like a local store and um, they can figure out a way to do some kind of social media for the store. And the store can like sponsor a part of the race entry for the team. Like, you know, they're just get creative. There are ways to, to offset your costs. And it's a vacation. It's a very physical vacation, but it's kind of like a vacation. That's a great answer. You know, and I think the primal quest, when I said that 10,000 figure, I think that was for the entire team. So it's essentially 2,500 yeah. per team per person. That, and it's, yeah, that sounds more like it. Yeah. yeah and it, and it, you know, it's essentially seven days. And like you said, when you start breaking it down by cost per day, it's really not, it's not that much. I know it seems like a lot of money up front, but like, you know, a normal vacation, you're going to spend a hundred dollars, at least on a hotel every night. And then you add in the cost of a rental car and the cost of meals and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't seem like that. Much <laughs> You're money. getting there. I mean, who yeah. why sleep at a five-star hotel when you can sleep in a ditch on the side yeah. of a road? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is perfect. I, I can definitely sell my wife on why we should invest all this money into adventure racing. This but, and, but then you get into like the places you get to go, um, you know, like, uh, it's really, you don't know where you're going to go until you're actually doing it. And sometimes like if the race, like Primal Quest has some epic like ropes courses and things like that, to do that, even on like a normal trip, you might spend 250 bucks just to Good have point. like a guide. So, you know, that's how I think about it. Like the, the adventure is very like, it's very high on a scale of adventure. And then if you break it down per day, it's really not that bad. Yeah. And when me and my friends did that 12 hour one, we rented bikes from a bike shop. And like you said, they had uh, kayaks 
that they provided for us and we just you know paid a fee and they're like if you yep. bring your own kayak you don't have to pay the fee and i was like okay cool yep. and then i think i think you're right i think we did buy our own paddles if i remember correctly um i'm not 100 percent positive on that but I mean, yeah. if you want to like entry, like I always suggest to people and um, when I first started, I borrowed a bike from somebody and I borrowed a paddle just to like, you know, get used to it and see if it was something I really wanted to do. And I was like, wait, okay, I love this. I need a bike. And even then, like I said, I didn't buy like a fancy bike. Like now I want a fancy bike, but it's a few years later, but you know, and then I eventually invested in a good paddle because I wanted to be at a, I wanted to race at a very competitive level. So you know, but if you just want to get out there and have fun, like it's, you can, you can get by with, uh, you don't need the highest end equipment to, to enjoy a, an, an adventure race and to do well in it. Yeah. Now, you know, triathlon has tryfind.com. I, I still, I think they still do, um, for finding races. OCR has mud run guide. Is there an adventure racing, like single resource where you can find all adventure races across the U S um, I would have to say the USARA, probably the U.S. Adventure Racing Association. Okay. Uh, uh, that would be my guess because that's those are all the sanctioned races in the U.S. If you want to go international, look at the Adventure Racing World Series. Um, those are like those races are in some of the most beautiful places on the planet. Um, they're really well run. Um, those are more, ex you know, they're expensive. Um, you know bigger entry fees, but they're also longer races. Um, but yeah, they're, the USARA is a great resource. Um, they have races and I believe on the website also, they may even say like the different adventure racing clubs. Um, so, you know, go find like an Ori, go find your local orienteering club and go to, and like, sometimes they post a map and you can go to your local park or wherever it is, your local wilderness area. And with the printed map and a compass and practice orienteering. Um, so, you know, you can do a lot of this stuff, like the practice leading up to it, like for free, technically. Cool. Now, when I look at some of the history, again, I don't know that much about adventure racing, but I remember, mm -hmm. you know, Eco Challenge was on TV for a couple of years. I remember Primal Quest was another big expedition uh, length one that was popular for a couple of years. Um, and then I feel like, I think Primal Quest went out of business or stopped putting on races for a while. And now is they, they were going, they were, yeah, they were coming back. Um, to, I don't know. I can't remember if they actually had that race or not, but um, yeah, they were coming back after a while. Um, I think it was in 20, 2000, was it last year? Maybe it was remember. last year. Um, but now I feel like there's like, I feel like for a while, like adventure racing, like back when Eco Challenge first came out, like I guess it was like the mid 90s or something around then, like adventure racing was on the up. And then it like took a dip from like a, like a, a what do you call it? Like, you know, from people knowing it, like, you know, yeah. it wasn't as known and kind of like faded into the background. And now with Eco Challenge back and it being on Amazon Prime, like that's great for the sport. I'm really excited that you know, Mark Burnett was like, we're doing eco challenge again, because it's really good for the sport. Um, you know, the more people that do it, the more money that can go into the sport from like sponsors and things like that. So it just gives more opportunity to people that want to do adventure racing. Um, another big race is God's own and that's in, um, New Zealand. I mentioned it before. And that's like a bucket list race. Um, that is just, it happens in March. And it is just one of those expedition length races. I think it's like a week long or something estimate and um, it's New Zealand. So <laughs> can't go wrong with that race. Gotcha. Yeah. I think we, you know, comparing it to OCR, it kind of reminds me of it where, you know, OCR a couple of years ago, we had, we were on several TV networks, right? You movie Battle Frog on ESPN, yep. NBC Sports had the Spartan series, CBS had Toughest Mudder, and now none of those are still going on. So, you know, even before COVID, right? Like none of that stuff was scheduled for this year before COVID. Yeah. So I think, you know, every industry is going to see some sort of ups and downs. And, um, you know, I, I do think, look, yeah. oh, sorry. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. I but, was just going to quickly say, like, I think that with the surge and people being interested in outdoor activities this year, I'm hoping that that, you know, helps sports develop more. 
um, outdoor sports, adventure sports, whether it is OCR, adventure racing, like mountain biking's gotten really huge where I live. But you can't get a bike. If you want a new bike, you can't get one for a very long time because they're sold out. So maybe it will be time for networks to invest more in these adventure sports, um, which would be great. Yeah. Now, you know, we mentioned some of the COVID stuff at the beginning. You said all adventure racing is canceled, but is that because of the uh, state travel policies like quarantine? Because it seems like you could still hold adventure races because you could essentially socially distance from everybody. <laughs> Yeah, you're pretty, pretty, it's a pretty socially yeah. distant sport, but minus your team members, unless it's like a shorter race, in which case you might be close with other teams. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, it has to do a lot of with logistics. Um, also with resources, you know, if they need, they need medical staff, if they have to evacuate somebody, you know, like things like that, that's taking, in my opinion, you know, that's just taking away resources. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm guessing, you know, the, whoever was organizing these races, all these different races were like, it's not feasible from a financial perspective and just from a logistics perspective and, and a racer safety perspective yeah. to be putting on these races. I also think people are currently less willing to travel yeah. in general, right? So it's a little bit harder. Now, we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that you, you had COVID. So one, take us through that experience. And then also, I kind of want to know the, you know, the, people are getting sick and then recovering, but you know, as from an app, I'm, I'm approaching this from an athlete's perspective uh, because I think there's plenty of other resources on what uh, the average person kind of goes through, but you know, they're, you know, they're like worried about long-term effects. Like, do you feel like it has affected your long-term performance? Right. Cause like someone who's just an, a sedentary individual is not going to notice a 5% decrease in performance, but someone who's an elite athlete, would notice a 5% decrease in performance if it had some sort of long lasting effect. So just kind yeah. of take me through that from an elite athlete's perspective. Um, yeah. So I had COVID the end of March. Um, I had very like, like the stereotypical symptoms. I had fever at first, a fever, high fever for a few days. Um, and then the fever went away. And then I got this, like, I got, it wasn't as much of a cough as much of like, I could it sounded like pneumonia was developing in my lungs. Every time I exhaled, I would just hear like deep gurgling in my lungs. And I have asthma. I've had it for over, I was diagnosed like over 25 years ago or about 25 years ago. And I have, I get like chronic bronchitis. I usually get bronchitis once to twice a year. So this was very different than any other time I had bronchitis. And at that point I was like, this is, I kind of had a hunch it was COVID, but it was also still flu season. Um, but once that, like the wheezing and the gurgling in my lungs started, I was like, this has to be COVID. Um, and a few days after that started to happen, I woke up one morning and I was coughing up blood. And I was like, okay, well, this is not good. Um, you know, I don't want to do damage to my lungs uh, if there's not already severe damage to them at this point. Um, I was able to get tested. Um, I actually went, wanted a, an x-ray of my lungs and they're like, no, we're just going to test you for the virus. I'm like, okay. Um, and I recovered. I would say like, I felt it took another like week after all my symptoms subsided. I, I like waited another week and then it still took me and the doctors cleared me before that, but it still took me when I started to move again. Any time, like I started to like breathing was more difficult, and I had such a burning sensation in my lungs, like I didn't want to run um, mm. for a few weeks after that. Actually, um, I would say like it was a little of like five weeks start to finish from when I had it to when I started to feel like somewhat normal again. Wow. Um, I was pretty tired for a while, and then. I just was like, okay, let me just take it slow and steady. So I was like, okay, we have to do really hard, like serious base training. Like don't push yourself. My body's recovering. I don't know if there are long-term uh, like consequences of this, of this virus. Let me be careful. So I was careful. And I felt like by the time it was like May, I was like getting into a groove again with training. Um, and then I crashed my bike on the road and I was just, I had a really bad road bike crash and I was just like, Oh, great. Like this is the last, this is what I needed now. But so that set me back another two weeks, but 
I've been training now and now my body feels pretty good. Um, I don't know if I have lasting effects because it's so humid in New York right now and so hot. Like I'm talking like, yeah, it's like 90 degrees. It's like, feels like a hundred or it's in the eighties. But even when it's in the seventies, the humidity is sometimes at 80 to 90% humidity. So as an asthmatic, I can't breathe in that as is. So it's been a little difficult for me to determine like if I have long-term, you know, a, any long-term damage done to my body. Um, but I figure if, if I'm having difficulties when the weather gets more like favorable, then I'll go see my pulmonologist and have like, you know, have more extensive work, extensive tests done on, you know, just to make sure I'm okay. Gotcha. Okay. That was a good answer. And but you know, I think, I, didn't... I think also it'd be hard to tell it. I think you'd be able to further tell if races were going on, you were actually be able to compete at your normal level. And then you could kind of compare it to some previous performances, but yeah. And I've been like, you know, I've been like this morning, I did like a, a threshold run uh, and it felt good. Like my body was moving well. And it was interesting because I wasn't breathing heavy until I like, was actually past what I thought my normal threshold, like what my threshold was, but I was, my heart rate was up. And that's what I noticed actually with COVID actually when I first started, like my heart rate was up, but I wasn't breathing heavy. So like, I'm trying to figure out like, is this the heat? Is this just my body's adapting to training? Like what's going on? So like you said, like, I think I'll just have to go out and do some tests on some, some things where I have a baseline, like my local trail where I know like if I do, X miles and X time in like a, in a good, like effort at like a, you know, moderate effort that I know where I'm at. Gotcha. Okay. Sounds good. And I think something people may not, I'm switching topics here, but yeah. I think some, some, something people may not realize is you were at world's toughest mother 2019. Correct? I was, yeah, I was there also tell 2017, people- but I broke my hip. <laughs> okay. So tell, <laughs> tell people where you, where you were at World Service Motor 2019, because I think everyone saw you and had no idea they were looking at you for those that don't necessarily follow the sport super closely. Um, I had the honor of hanging out with one of my very dear friends, Coach, and uh, I was at Coach's Corner for the whole event. Um, and I was up top with Coach, making sure everybody was just having a, you know, a of like a little uh, rainbow in the middle of all of the, the mud that they were running through. And if you had the pleasure of finding me in the middle of the night, I was also inside of coach's corner in like the, in the, I don't even know what you want to call that. <laughs> it, it was very interesting, kind of scary. Um, I was wearing a unicorn head. So I've gotten, I know some people like hit me in the head and stuff like it didn't hurt me. Don't worry. But uh, they didn't know it was me in there. But I figured I would have fun, you know, try to try to have fun with the racers. I know if I was running through there and I saw some weird person with a unicorn head on, I would really enjoy it, actually. Yeah, I think, I think some people thought they were tripping or sl- yeah. <laughs> ha- sleep yeah. hallucination uh, deprived there. <laughs> that, yeah. that would definitely elevate hallucinations, that, that one obstacle. I was super excited to see you there. It was nice to see a friendly face and someone from I was familiar with uh, every lap and uh, kind of wave high. So, you know, and it was cool. fun from my perspective to see everybody, you know, all the people that I know and to see them from the other side and to be able to like cheer them on and to see people I haven't seen in, in quite a few years too. Like it was just really enjoyable to, to be there as, you know, a cheerleader and as more support versus like racing next to people. Yeah. So let's talk future plans. Um, assuming everything kind of goes back to normal 2021, uh, we do an adventure racing, interest in coming back to world's toughest, even without prize money. Yeah. Um, I think gonna go we're going to, I'm going to stick to a mix. I'm definitely like played into being a multi, much more of a multi-sport athlete. Um, so, and, and actually just recently I got into downhill mountain biking and it's funny cause I posted this video, a video on my, I only went for the third time ever yesterday, but I posted a video on my Instagram the other week of my second time going. And from that time to this time, I'm a completely different rider already. So I'm really into mountain biking. So I'm looking into some very long mountain biking races. Um, I'd like to do like an ultra beast or two. 
um, you know, at World's Toughest Mudder is on the table. There's another event at that time. So I may have to make a choice. And then um, adventure races. I definitely, I, I need to do a few of those next year. It's just, that's where my heart and soul is. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I need, I need to fulfill, fulfill that, especially now. Any sort of crazy plans? Because I remember the first time I met you, you were planning to do some sort of ridiculous wintertime run from, I think it was on the Adirondack. Major- yeah. So Ryan Atkins has the summer record for that. No woman has done it ever. Uh, like, well, they've done it. Sorry. My friend Nancy crushed. I don't know if she has the record, but she did it in the summer in like six days. She hiked it. But I was looking to do it in the winter because I thought well, if I'm going to dive in, I might as well really dive in. But, um, you know, like, I think like that's, that is like on the table. Um, it's a matter of how races pan out because I really want to race. Like, you know, like if you if I'm sure anybody who's listening to this, if they're used to just racing into that atmosphere of racing and being with people, like I really miss it. I'm, you probably miss it. Like we all miss it. So I think races are going to take priority. And then other projects will, you know, be on like the next level, like backup plan. And what, what ended up happening with that wintertime uh, run? Uh, a historic blizzard dumped four feet of snow a few days into my effort and four feet of snow in 24 hours. So uh, I tried to keep going, but at that point it was just, uh, it, it was pretty much not feasible. Yeah. And I remember talking to you ahead of time about it and you're like, yeah, you know, there, there's a reason that no one's done it in the winter. It's, it's because People of that. Have. There's a handful, oh, of, you, handful, of, handful of men have done it. I think like their record, I think it's Corey de Laval. He's like, he did it in, in eight days, eight days and change in the winter. And Ryan's record in the summer is just over three days to give you an idea of how different it is a uh, winter versus summer. Wow. You know, I, I can't remember if I, used your that concept for OCR America or if that was just an influence on me but I I acutely remember being aware of like you know you you comparing the summer to the winter version and and being like you know because of the w- winter weather conditions and the possibility of snow it it severely affects the ability to do it which is one of the reasons when I made did OCR America too I switched it to winter to add like another or different type of challenge. Yeah. And it really is a big challenge once you like deal with any type of weather and the cold, especially like, it's just, it's amazing how much it can slow you down. Yep. And the, I specifically remember yours, yours ending because of a blizzard. And I was like, all right, you know, there's a chance I do OCR America in the winter and it just, you know, we, we go two days and it just, we just get snowed in. Like I physically can't drive the next location. Yeah. So when I actually printed the medals, I left the year off because I was like, well, if this, if this doesn't work, I'll just try it again next year and pray <laughs> well, for better weather. Plan, uh, that's a really good plan, actually. Yeah. You know, I mean, there comes a point, I think, with anybody like, you know, we can push ourselves, we can push ourselves and we can push ourselves way past our, what we perceive our limits to be. But there also comes a point when I think, you know, your risk outweighs your reward and you have to like pull the plug on something and say, you know what, like, this will be here next year or whenever it will be here and I can come back and I will come back and do it again. Yeah. Good advice there. Now we like to compare sports to OCR and we've done that a lot this episode, but are there any other kind of key lessons or takeaways you think people can take from adventure racing and apply to obstacle course racing? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, uh, in adventure racing in general, like, you know, you learn a lot to be very self-sufficient um, because you sometimes have, you pretty much have no choice once you leave your transition area. Um, and I think like in general, that prepares you for the unknown. And it also gives you like a certain perspective where it broadens what you think your actual reach is. You know, like I can always, and I say this about any of these these ultra ultra length races I've done is that I've learned so much and I've learned like, okay, if I can do that, if I'm able to do that, like in that condition, I can definitely do another five mile loop at world's toughest mutter. You know, like you learn to push and you learn, like you learn like just strategy, you learn how to pace yourself um, for like ultra length stuff, even like in like an ultra beast, like you know how you learn a lot about your body. And that helps when you know, 
when you think you've hit your limit, but you know, but you actually realize you have many hours left before you really hit your limit. Um, that helps that may like make your laps at like an ultra beast a few minutes faster. Um, if not like significantly faster, um, you know, your body goes under a lot of stress and adventure racing. It's helped me like hone in on nutrition even more so. Um, because you know, a few days in your body can be real, your body's, your stomach is so just your stomach hopefully isn't destroyed, but like I've had my stomach destroyed. Um, so I've like learned to even hone my nutrition, hone in on like better nutrition and all that, any of that experience will help you in OCR. Um, especially like if you're looking at like the longer OCRs, um, you know, that's just, it's trial and error. That's it. Like, and even you do that in your, in your training and you do it in your racing and sometimes you mess up and you mess up really badly, but like, don't be defeated. Be like, okay, what did I learn here and how can I apply it to prevent that from happening again? Great advice. We're going to start wrapping things up here before we go. Tell us one thing people would be surprised to know about you. Less having to do with OCR or fitness, right. I'd say the better. So let's see. So as it has nothing to do with OCR. So when I, I uh, grew up playing classical flute and my, after my senior year of high school, before I went to college, I toured Europe with a concert band and a choir. And we played all over Europe at like um, festivals and we played in the gardens where the sound of music was filmed and we played at the cemetery at Normandy. So um, yeah, I was in a touring concert band as a flautist. That's really interesting. I, yeah, completely shocked. I played saxophone in high school and Oh, I'm jealous. I wanted to play saxophone so badly. How I ended up with flute was that was my second choice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I enjoyed it for a couple of years and then it was like, well, we bought the saxophone, so I might as well just continue to take it through the end of high school. So I'm Wait, not... so does that mean like if we're at a race together, we could have like a jam session? Oh my goodness. I can't even, the last, literally the last time I played saxophone was in high school. So it's been a hot even minute. Better. Even better. <laughs> I, I mean, I know where to put my fingers. I, I don't know if I can make anything that's even remotely coherent is called, to call music. <laughs> that's what auto-tune is for. <laughs> I've also I've been to I've been to the Sound of Music uh, Garden there where they filmed Salzburg the, yeah yeah Salzburg um and I've been to Normandy I've been to both of those locations and I oh, was wow. in I was in the Sound of Music in high school as my senior year in the play oh wow so I played <laughs> I didn't know that I played Friedrich the oldest boy which was oh so you sing as well I do sing yeah um and I, the if you look at the if you've seen the movie the the younger boy hit there's like a really high note it's like a yep. high g or something the younger boy sings it in the play the older boy is supposed to sing it like falsetto voice so that's what i sang uh, as a senior in high school and uh, all right so, so we definitely have a band in the works <laughs> i think anybody who's listening please um, apply with your talent um we'll be forming this band for next year's uh season <laughs> amazing <laughs> All right, before, actual last question, before we go, any final shout outs you want to give friends, family, sponsors, et cetera? Um, I just, I guess, well, I mean, I just everybody, the whole community in general, everybody's great. I love just seeing what people are up to, the challenges that they've, you know, put themselves up to during this time. It's really inspiring to see people just doing what they're doing and doing what they love to do even during these times. And then just want to, I'll give a shout out to um, three, three companies who I do stuff with. Um, that's the Feel Good Lab. They're a all natural sport recovery cream. Um, really great guys behind them. I have some things coming up with them in the near future. And then um, Arcteryx and Solomon. And um, they've both been really great companies to me. So, uh, and uh, support my crazy stuff. So just really happy to uh, be uh, like working with all those companies. Cool. And I lied. I just thought of another question. Yeah. You know, Ryan Atkins and Jonathan Albin, both of them are like essentially untouchable in OCR, depending on the distance in the race. Is there an adventure racing equivalent? Like, is there a team or a guy or a girl who's like, you know, legend in this, in the sport already? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm gonna say like, 
I don't have an exact name of somebody. I know a bunch of, I know some people who have been doing it for a long time who are just wicked adventure racers. I mean, people that I've never seen somebody navigate so quickly through such treacherous terrain. Um, but I will say though, like watch Eco Challenge. There is, I, there are some interesting like things that have happened there and you will see some racers come out of the woodwork that haven't raced in a while. Um, like that was, I'm, I'm a little bummed out. I have some FOMO that I did not go to that race, but, um, but I would watch it because you will see some of the, some of the people from the past. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. This podcast will be dropping just before I think the first episode airs. So, uh, good timing by me not yeah, mess- I, didn't, I didn't necessarily realize it <laughs> like this this would have been a, a really thoughtful plan that i put into uh put into work a- ahead of time that was you know again well thought out but that's that's not the case just a little bit of luck i've been actually i think i've been trying i've i think i've asked you to come on the podcast before and we never actually made our schedules work but so yeah uh good to have you on thanks again for coming and uh Anyone that wants to pick up some books or blog mitts, you can go to teamstrengthspeed.com. All that's available there. Digital I'm books. I'm going to plug myself. Oh, go if for anybody, it. If you want to get in contact with me, um, you can also follow me on Instagram. I'm Seth Adventures. Um, you can either contact me via there, or I have a very outdated website that I need to update, and that's just stephaniebishop.com. Nice. So people can check that out. Again, teamstrengthspeed.com for my books. Uh, my biography, Ultra OCR Man, Special Forces Soldier to Record Setting Obstacle Course Racer can be found there. And then all my books are available on digital, on Amazon. But if you're going to get them off Amazon, go to my website first. You can click through and I get like referral credits, essentially a referral. Uh, so click through awesome. my website first <laughs> before you Excellent. go over there. And uh, yeah, and my biography is also available on Audible for those of you who like listening to uh, nonfiction stuff while you run, which is what I do. So. It's cool. perfect for your adventure race training. Yes, absolutely. Keep, keep your mind busy and engage doing something. All right, Steph, great talking to you. And um, yeah, stay safe. And hopefully we'll see you again in 2021 once racing and normal season stuff resumes. That would be wonderful. I am looking forward to it. All right. Catch you later. Thank you.